All right. Well, this is a really fun one. Celebrity trainer Nicole Stewart is back and she brought friends. If you remember, we had Nicole on the show back in episode 45. That was before the show was even on Zoom. It was just a phone call. So she's here today and she's got two other celebrity trainers with her, Desi Bartlett and Andrea Orbeck. And together, these three ladies have written a book called Total Body Beautiful. It's great. It's a great read. Very informative. And this was a really fun interview. Get to know these lovely ladies and learn all about their book right now. So I'll let you each introduce yourselves so that the, the people that aren't seeing it can hear uh, the voice that goes with the name. And then you can tell a little bit about your background and uh, qualifications. Who wants to go first? Nicole, <laughs> go ahead. Pro to the uh, show, Nicole. Yes, welcome back. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having us again. Um, my name is Nicole Stewart, and mm -hmm. I am a Pilates trainer and a writer and, you know, slash, slash actor. Um, and I've been training Pilates for over 20 years. Um, I was trained by Mari Windsor. I started in the 90s and I worked for her for about four or five years. And then I went off on my own and I've been working for myself ever since. And um, I have a dance background. I grew up in Las Vegas. And I think maybe that's enough about me. <laughs> that's a lot. If you want more, they can listen to our interview that we talk about your whole life story for an hour. So, yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay. Let's go, go next. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, my name is Desi Bartlett, and I'm originally from Chicago. I have my degree in kinesiology, my master's degree in corporate fitness. And um, this year I went back to school. I'm getting my PhD in exercise science. This is my second book that I've written. My first one is called Your Strong, Sexy Pregnancy. I also specialize in pre and postnatal yoga and fitness. I created the round yoga mat with Manduka Yoga. I've done a ton of videos and um, 10 DVDs when DVDs were a thing. And you can find me on Beachbody On Demand. Okay, very cool. Nice. I am the third author of this book, Total Body Beautiful. My name is Andrea Orbeck. I'm Canadian born. And when I retired from the women's national bobsled team, after the 2002 Olympics, I moved to California to start to work kind of in a clinical environment. My background is kinesiology. I do have a little bit of pre and postnatal specialty. And so I kind of just uh, was working with a client doing some physio type stuff. And I got picked up by um, a celebrity. And from there, I kind of got the golden handshake, which kept me in the US. And so from there, I was able to kind of use some of my specialties. And then from there, I was able to create like a DVD program. And so that was great after my experience with uh, a lot of the supermodel girls with Victoria's Secret. So once you become the Pied Piper of all things bikini, you kind of get, you know, <laughs> you, you stay in LA, which I've done. And so from there, I just, you know, see clients, I do fitness and um, a little bit of physio, just depending on what the person needs. And so there I am in between clients right now talking to you. Oh, very cool. Wow. So how do you guys all know each other? How did you all meet each other? How did we so meet that was, Andrea? Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I forgot. I feel like when you're um, at our level, if I do say so ourselves, I feel like we're always one degree separated from each other. And so, you know, with all of us still being intertwined under the category of fitness, even though we have kind of different areas of specificity, we always kind of know one another in Hollywood, you know, and then I think it just gets narrower and narrower through friends that know each other or events and stuff like that. So I feel like Nicole and I met through the, maybe maybe the gym. The gym. I was going to say we would, yeah. we worked at yeah. the yeah. uh, same gym for a long time. And I, I yeah. would always see Andrea, but I don't really initially remember being introduced to you or how we, cause I remember like we went out a couple of times too. Yeah. Maybe Lori, maybe. Could I know I'm been Lori. That's how we know Desi. I would say that's our common denominator is our friend, Lori Bregman, who is phenomenal at everything actually having to do with the, the pregnancy space. So yeah. I think with, yeah. with Desi's area, yeah, that was our, that was our common denominator. So you guys are all friends. I mean, obviously you wrote this book together. You're, so you're kind of like a t on a team. You're not competing with each other for clients or things like that. 
No, in fact, we actually share a lot of clients. So a lot of us, because we kind of have our different categories, mm. we've had the, the, you know, the blessing to be able to work with people, especially industry related, depending on, you know, like this book is going to affirm where they are in their areas, you know, mostly as females, we all work with men, of course, too, but, uh, you know, that tends to be our highest common, you know, gender of client. And so I, yeah, that's, that's where it is. We've each complimented. So we have a several clients that are actually high profile industry people that each of us have worked with them in our area specificity. So I don't even know if that was in the back of our minds when they decided to huh. aggregate what we do in this book. Would you guys say that's true? Yeah, for sure. And I call us the dream team, because in addition huh. to each of us having separate specialties, which really cool because we can support one another and support um, the client ultimately. The other thing that I think is um, worth mentioning is that there's no competition personally either. And to have two women like in my corner all the time, no matter what, for the three of us, I think during the pandemic, especially, that was huge. You know, we were all so isolated and we were all stuck in our houses. And so we got together and we're like, well, what can we do for others that we're doing for one another and for our clients? So I, I just think it bears mentioning that um, I feel so supported by these women and I hope they feel supported by me as well. Yeah. yeah. So how do you write a book with three people? Like, how does that, how does that work? <laughs> does it make it easier or harder? Easier. Easier. Totally. I think. It was very, it was very, um, it was, I, I hate to say easy, but it was very easy. Um, yeah. It was all like, uh, Desi is actually, she's being very modest, but Desi is the one, it was her idea to pull us all together. And she actually chose us, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. And she had this idea and she pitched it to me and I thought, wow, that's a really great idea. And then COVID happened. And then she told me, um, yeah, I brought in Andrea Orbit. I'm like, oh my God, I know Andrea. We, you know, we've shared clients at this point. We, I know, I totally know Andrea. Um, <laughs> and it sort of started from that point forward and then COVID. So it was, it was a very cool opportunity to have this project through COVID. And I don't know. Yeah, no, it's cool. It's, it's I read the book. It's a great book. Um, I know it's about women's health, but I think men should, I'm going to help you sell this to men too, because I think men should read it for two reasons. One, I think a lot of the concepts apply to men. I know some of the stuff is more towards, you know, about, uh, you know, estrogen and women's hormones and things like that. Um, but a lot of, you know, there's a lot of overlap with a lot of the concepts. And also I think it's good for us to read this to learn about women because we don't know anything. We're idiots. We, and so we're, I'm like reading this. I'm going, Oh, okay. This, like this thing's learning about women. We have girlfriends, we have wives and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, mothers and sisters. So it's good for us to know these things too. It helped understand women, which again, we don't know a lot about you guys. So it was really educational <laughs> for me. I really enjoyed it, but let's start with the, uh, the recommendations. That's really cool that you got because you guys talk about you're, you're very like kind of under the radar about the recommendations. But the book, I mean, it has Julia Roberts, Ashley Tisdale, Anna Ferris, Heidi Klum, and then Kate Hudson does the foreword. Um, talk about that. Like, how did you I mean, it must have been easy to get Kate to do it because you work with her all the time. Right, Nicole? Well, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I mean, I've known her for so long now. It's been 20 plus years. I can't even believe I'm saying that. Um, her first baby just graduated high school and he's like on his way to college. And I'm like, oh my God, how did that happen? <laughs> um, so it felt like a very natural thing to do to ask her to write the foreword. And we had talked about it and it was my idea. And I just thought, you know what? It just, it never hurts to ask. And it just felt like the right thing to do because, We've grown so close over the years and we're like sisters, as she always says. So um, <laughs> and, and she was happy to do it. So it was very exciting to actually be able to ask for that and have her reciprocate the offer back, you know, and it was very generous and kind and it made us all very excited because actually how I met Desi was through, well, our friend Lori who keeps it all goes back to Lori. 
but um, Desi worked with Kate during her last pregnancy. So I had, I never met her in passing, but she would say, oh, I did yoga with Desi two days ago. So let's focus on this or, you know what I mean? So um, that's when I first started hearing about Desi and then, um, and then Desi sent me a yoga mat and then I posted it because I thought it was really cool because it was round and then I don't know. And then it sort of flourished from there. Yeah. Well, it definitely lends a lot of credibility to have those names saying that, you know, you guys, are, like you said, the dream team, basically, and that just solidifies it. Yeah, I agree. And I feel like with celebrities, you know, when we have had the relationships that we've had with our celebrities for so long, circling back to this book being collaborative and these, you know, us three women lifting each other up and the aforementioned not being competitive. I think the spirit behind that also is reflected with a lot of our celebrity clients because they were happy for us to have what we do for them do for other women and for them to endorse it they knew the power of being able to kind of heighten what they've experienced from us to get to you know uh women that might not have the chance to access us and so that's kind of how i felt that my quotes came in with that intention so just it just felt win-win and very collaborative on a larger scale as well you know and mm -hmm. so that was so appreciated yeah so i start reading it and it's like it starts off in a way it kind of starts off kind of dark Right. Because it's ta it's talking about the hormones and aging. Yeah. And I'm just going, oh, wow, this this is depressing. Like, you know, but then it's like you got to stick with it because then it's then you talk about how exercise and diet can actually make a huge difference mm -hmm. in, in in reversing a lot of these things. Right. What did they, What was yes. the quote? It said, if hormonal aging were a broken down car, fitness and wellness would be a Lamborghini. I love that. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Good. I'm glad you did. You know, I think it is akin to that. And if, if life, if loving yourself and wanting to know all the things about yourself, be it mental and physical and, you know, hormonal, you have to take those pit stops. And that is just simply a truth. If we're pretending that life is going to be lived through a filter of how you present yourself, you're going to be severely disappointed. And those things have their place too. But in all reality, us women do have phases every decade and things do happen. And if you start out really fit and you want to maintain it, or conversely, if you're not super fit and you start seeing the effects of age, which are an undeniable situation, what better than to have a mechanic, the three of us, be able to help you translate and understand what is happening? What are the hormones that affect you, men and women, you know? And so mm -hmm. what can you do about it? And I just think that it helps empower people and women to know and navigate their own body's changes because then it arms you to be able to talk to doctors about those changes, which sometimes is another issue in women's lives where they're kind of minimized and they're not really taken seriously or the symptoms that a woman will go through pre -peri and post-menopause tend to have symptoms. And then we're just kind of told, oh, well, that's just the way you're going to deal with it. And that's not the options for women. And we know so much now that we, you know, we want to arm women. And so I hope that it translates and, and benefits them that way. Yeah. And so to echo, to echo what Andy's saying, um, I work with a lot of hormones, <laughs> whether it's because I'm working with a pregnant woman or a woman who's moving through menopause or even men, you know, as, as men start to age in the reduction of testosterone, and generally what happens um, within the medical community, like we love our, our doctors and especially our doctors who are really awake and, and want to have a holistic approach, but um, hormonal replacement therapy, HRT, is what's usually given to women at menopause. Mm. And it can create a lot of problems. And sometimes the side effects from HRT are worse than the side effects from menopause itself. So what can we do that's natural and positive that can work as an intervention for you? And so we find that exercise and mind-body practices can really do that. But we want to have a little bit from, from each category, right? We want to have the yoga and the meditation and the core strength and the fitness, the um, resistance training for the strength and the bones, and the list kind of goes on and on. But to have one person kind of do all that would be like a little too much. So to have us each working together as a team and tandem and holding hands and I, I believe Andy put it as um, embracing the client together or embracing the woman, joining hands and embracing her to lift her. That feels 
that feels like it's a little bit safer, more empowering, and and just a better choice for a lot of women. Yeah, I worry about the the hormone replacement stuff, and I even see and men are doing a lot of that too. You're seeing younger and younger men, I think legally now taking um, is it HGH or testosterone and stuff like yeah. to supplement. And I don't, I feel like that's because once you take the artificial hormones, your your body naturally stops producing them, right? Well, if you yes. have bio, yes, and and bioidenticals are a whole other category, which would be a whole other podcast and probably mm. a whole other book. And so that said, not being in you know an OBGYN or an endocrinologist, we need to know what our levels are to be able to make very informed decisions about how you know the decision to explore things that mimic the reduction of the hormones that are lost during age, both men and women, we need to be able to have educated conversations about them to know what are all the modalities that we can do? What are the things that impact me from in regards to sleep? And, you know, cortisol, as an example, you know, you, maybe you don't have adrenal failure, if we were to just hypothetically say, but you have a lot of stress in your life, but then you still want to lose this extra 10 pounds that say menopause has brought on to your life, which is natural and a normal thing. If you were to want to kind of combat that, you need to get your stress levels down, not even saying, you know, or assigning yourself someone who says I have ad adrenal fatigue, you know, which is controversial, too. So we want to be able to equip women to do everything they can in conjunction to supporting them with a conversation with their doctor or whoever would, you know, help them navigate those decisions. There's a lot of things you can do up until that conversation. And I think rather than running to that conversation with your physician first, you should be empowered to know what are all the things that I can do, not only to make myself feel good, let's say on the hormone level, but just to, to feel great in other aspects of our lives you know, wellness and peace and being able to not be in a stressed environment and have energy for your kids. And even then to look at things like your sex life, it's just, it's a huge gambit and it deserves so much attention. It probably could end up being five more books in total dealing with it, but hopefully we've cracked the ice on this first one. Yeah. So basically, you know, if you read this book and you do a lot of these recommendations, you may be able to, uh, forego some of the hormo uh, hormones like i would think like that has its place but you I'm, I'm assuming most people prefer not to be on hormones they'd rather be able to do it with diet and exercise at least i would right that's a good question i think that's a really good question and i think that you know if someone were to be told let's say hypothetically again using hypotheticals if you have you know if you're overweight and then you have obesity related diseases that you're susceptible to do we necessarily run and go on lipitor or run and go on and do these other modalities mm -hmm. whereas there's things that we can take to delay the onset of how severe hormones do affect us or delay the severity and those things are within your control before you need to kind of consult the clinical um, you know, community, which has its place. It has its conversations. But let, why don't we equip ourselves with all these things we can do that are maybe overdue or that we need to be reminded or even given a program that we can follow to see how potential you can feel before kind of going the synthetic route? Right. So with the diet, that's a huge part of it, I think. Um, you say clean proteins, healthy fats, antioxidant rich, rich veggies, and low sugar. So how do you find the specifics on like grams of fats, protein, sugar, and carbs? Is there, is there a set percentage or is there an app to, that you recommend using or? I do you do an you app? have an app? Girls, do you remember the app we referred to? I'm so sorry. I, yeah, I should have looked at my notes for that one. I don't remember. I think we used, it was like, it's fit pal or something like that. Oh, my so fitness pal? Yes, my fitness I love that pal, one. Yeah, that's what I, I do too. So everyone's macronutrient and micronutrient um, requirements are going to be slightly different, right? So when we're talking about macros, we're talking about carbs, proteins, and fat. And then within those, we have to kind of look at like what quality is each one. You know, when we're talking about carbs, I'm not going to hand you a bunch of white bread. I'm going to give you some like really um, healthy grains and veggies. But what I found um, specifically with women as, as we go through menopause is that it can be a little bit more beneficial to increase the protein and the fat for satiety so that we're not, you know, like 6 p.m. We're like, where are the carbs? And you want to like eat the wallpaper off the wall because you just need something to crunch. So um, we didn't give necessarily specific recommendations for macros and micros in this book because it is such an individual thing. 
I, I highly recommend, as Andy said, that you get your blood work done because you ha also have to look at micronutrients. You know, if your iron is super, super low and you're anemic, my gosh, I, I got to start with you there. I got to get, you know, um, rich sources of iron for you and then maybe recommend like a cast iron skillet because your food is going to absorb some of that as well. So that, to Andy's point, that could be a whole other book as well. Yeah, no, it just seems like there's so many diets out there. I mean, like I got this with the whole 30, that's one. And then there's like vegan and then there's keto and it's just confusing. And, I, and I've had some of the experts on my show and they'll, you know, preach their diet, but I feel like everyone needs to pick one that's right for them. Is that's, so that's what I've understood. I think I agree 100%. Yeah. I think the takeaway with regarding nutrition, none of us being nutritionalists, but you know, we do work with celebrities that play them on TV. <laughs> um, so <laughs> if we, if we were to make sure that we're, you know, we're talking about nutrition and different diets, which means just different philosophies about what works regarding absorption and, you know, your metabolic set point and supporting someone who's athletic. That's just a template that cannot be, you know, it's so individual, um, as the book mentions, it's kind of a matter of experimenting as well. You have to be someone who your own template to see after 10 days, two weeks in a month, how does this certain nutritional profile assist me in the things I'm looking for with regards to energy and, you know, uh, uh, muscle mass and, mm -hmm. you know, all those things. And so those need to be looked at. And so it's a matter of experimenting and that just, you know, it goes to the responsibility of the reader as well to take the information and then try and learn as much as they can with the advice about how it applies to them. Right. And I think most people know kind of what to eat. Like my doctor told me, he's like, you know what to do to eat healthy. <laughs> you know, like, you know, he's like, yeah. cut out red meat. You know, it's like the same things, eat whole grains, vegetables, fruits, like don't eat too much sugar. It's, you know, it's a lot of things, but so that's where kind of like the, the chapters, this is the part I really liked about the book is the mental stuff. Cause I think a lot of people know, you know, what's good food and bad food and exercise versus not exercising. So how do you shift that? So yeah, talk about that. Like, how do you do those, make that shift in your head? Cause I, I found that part of the book, the most fascinating. Um, I, I would, it's practice. It's, it's showing up. It's forcing yourself to do the things you don't want to do when you know they're the right things to do. Like, mm -hmm. um, and, and the, the, the voices in your head. I mean, I, I, I wrote a lot of the mental stuff, just correlating it to my own mental challenges that I had personally. So, I mean, you know, what works for me might not work for everybody, but maybe it'll work for one other person. But, you know, that came from years of therapy and also, you know, just learning that lesson of doing the things you don't want to do to make you feel better because you're like, you're never going to want to get out of bed in the morning. Like I have a friend who you know, was like, uh, for me, like, I, I was like, I got to get out of the bed. Cause I've like learned that I, it's ingrained in me, you know, waking up at whatever time it was for my 6am client and, and being there for them to support them. That's what I was getting paid for. So through the years of doing this job, I've learned how, what is good and what is bad. And I've been able to train myself, but circling back to my friend, who's like, for me, I love the bed, you know, and I, I didn't tell her this, but I thought about it the other day. And I was like, the bed is her enemy. The bed mm. is the thing that wants to keep her like, stay in bed, stay cozy, stay the same. Don't go for your walk. It's like that, that, that natural thing. I think as people, we don't, I mean, and it's very, I mean, it could be I don't know, athletes too. I find that it's hard for everybody. Like we don't always want to do the right things, you know? So I think you have to show up for yourself every day and make it a practice, make it a habit, like brushing your teeth, washing your hair, the food, the like, and, and take baby steps doing it. Well, yeah. And then the stuff about like rewiring your brain, I thought that was really interesting. Like there's research that shows that, you know, that you can actually, uh, the brain can continue to grow. And so if, if you make that rewiring is the first step is to believe that that actually can happen. Mm -hmm. And then it's just like changing the habits, right? That's a big piece of it is actually 
force you because and then the the benefits of diet and extra exercise again are i'm sure most people know that but it's just forcing yourself to um to get out of your comfort zone i think that was another thing you mentioned which i don't know if you guys are you guys familiar with david goggins at all like i love that guy he's a little crazy of course yeah but he but he talks about how comfort zones are poison so that's what it sounds like mm -hmm. with your friend with the bed like that's her comfort zone it's like if you're in your comfort zone too long it's really bad for you yeah, for sure. No. And all, all the things that you, you know, that you know, you shouldn't be doing and yet you do them. Those are all, I guess, like you were saying, the, the, the poison, but they're the things that want to keep you stuck and safe and the same. So you have mm -hmm. to break through those things. And I know it's all easier said than actually done, but it, it, it can happen and it does happen and it might not happen the first day or the first week but you know five years later 10 years later you know and I mean I just know this for myself because of my own background of you know suffering from depression and also um having mental illness in my family and just you know fighting against all of those odds to show up for yourself it's really important to do that and you're not going to want to it'll be the hardest thing you do for yourself but it'll be the most rewarding thing and you just keep growing you just mm -hmm. keep growing well yeah and I think there's a lot of women that have kind of I mean well probably men too but a lot of people just have insecurities about their bodies and so doesn't that kind of hinder them from working out a lot of times like they don't want to be seen working out in a gym I think that's why they invented the the curves gym right I don't know about <laughs> that but we do do a lot of house calls <laughs> oh really? I I, yeah. I haven't been by the way at the gym since COVID. I mean, but that's not because people. I did have a few clients who who um don't want to see themselves in the mirrors, so they would come to my house to work out. Um, and you know they are working through those issues. Um, but I did have some of those. So yes, it's that is true. But also, I mean, I think mostly it's convenience. And then also, like, if they're celebrities, they don't always like going to the gym, you know, but. Right. Well, yeah, because I know that this part, I think this is important for people to know. I like that you put this in the book about how, like, when you trained Anna Ferris uh, for the house bunny, like that she in a lot of these roles that people that the celebrities take. Uh, they're, th these diets that they're on are restricted calorie diets that shouldn't be followed in the long term. Cause I think people see them, they go, okay, that's how I should be all the time. And if I'm not like that, I'm a failure. And it's like, even the celebrities that are doing these diets, like this is like a short-term thing for this one role. Correct. For sure. I mean, she was incredible, but she was on like, um, and I don't know, this was a long time ago, but I want to say it was like a thousand calories a day, but she was going to be in a bathing suit the whole movie. So it, she knew that I knew that. And we took it day by day, but she had to do the thing that she, you know, was not easy to do that. It's not easy to end the workout. She was working out two or three times a day, but she really was determined and open-minded. And, you know, she had a huge transformation um, with her body. And, and it, you know, like, I think all of us can agree that, you know, we can only take people to the well. We can't make them drink the water unless they have that mental capacity to be that focused and determined and to show up. And um, Anna was that, you know, she was ready. She was like, and it really paid off in spades. Right. Know? But if they do it too long, it's you're, you're saying that it actually can cause damage like to your to, to your metabolism long, long term. Yeah. And I mean, I think she was even quoted saying like, I can't live like this for the rest of my life. This was for, and I'm probably not quoting it properly. So I'll just say that now, but, um, she, yeah, it wasn't a lifetime of a thousand calories a day. It was for that. And then she slowly started, you know, to go back to her normal, whatever her cheats or whatever it was, but you know, she had that behind her now, you know, that doing that work. You know, so she knows what that's um, like, and she can go back to that, you know, for one of them, <laughs> another movie if she's going to be in a bikini. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And one of the things also you say in the book that uh, a, a good tip is that 
uh, and it sounds silly, but you say saying things out loud is actually helpful because then you'll actually hear the message. Because that I feel like that's one of the biggest things with with uh, getting people to work out is just motivation. So that's one thing that could help is just saying it out loud and talking to yourself, maybe telling yourself to work yes. out. So going back to your point about Goggins, I love Goggins, by the way, which yes. is sort of ironic because I'm the yoga teacher in the group. But um, when he's working out and he's you know doing his bench press and he's saying, you don't know me, son. You don't know me, son. I do that. <laughs> I totally do that because I want to have that outside motivational voice. I know what I do for other people. I know what these beautiful women do for other people. I want to do that for myself and I want to show up for myself too. Mm -hmm. um, and then just going back to what y'all were just mm -hmm. talking about with, you know, restrictive dieting and all that stuff. And um, so much of the entertainment world and also the fitness world, I think is cyclical. And there are times when you have to just show up with a, a certain body type or a certain amount of energy, or there's times when you get to restore and relax and nourish again. So if we can just remember that things are cyclical and when, when we're in that go time, the, you don't know me son mantra, or you can do it, or you've got this, that can totally help. Yeah. Well, and then also you talk about, um, in the book, I think this is an important, uh, part too, about the, uh, you know, establishing healthy boundaries. Cause there's so many distractions. That's another thing that, that holds people back from working out. And, uh, you, you, you use the term energy vampires. And so explain what that is. Cause I, I, I think that's really inf informative too. <laughs> um, so one of the things with energy vampires is, you know, when they call you because you don't want to answer the phone, you know, it's going to be a half an hour time suck. You know, that it's going to be you listening the whole time. They're probably not even going to ask how you are and they're going to ask for favors, that kind of thing. And I feel like for women, especially as we start to mature and come into our own, we have the ability to say no, but in a loving way. You know, it doesn't have to be like, no, or, or hide from the phone. It can be like, hey, yeah, I love you. I have two minutes to chat and then I really got to run. So you can still recognize people um, without, you know, putting them off and still honoring yourself. You need that time for yourself. You got to take care of yourself so that you fill up your own cup so that you show up strong for yourself. If you're married, for your spouse, for your family, for your clients, for your friends. Mm -hmm. I don't have that to give to the lady that wants to chat with me on the phone for half an hour. Yeah. Well, and I think the invent invention of texting, like, I feel like that saved so many things. I love texting. I love it way more than talking on the phone. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So much so, easier. Yeah. So <laughs> you, they got the energy vampires, but then the, 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 on the other side, you'd have the choosing your tribe. You talk about that. I love that too. Like choosing your, what is it? Choose your tribe and love them hard. That's a catchy quote. Um, you know, and just like surrounding yourself with like-minded people that, that can probably help for like exercise regimens too. Right. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Research, research is undeniable about, you know, you know, who you surround yourself is probably the statistically highest outcome of what you're going to be like. It's a mirror and a reflection, but then ingrained in that is also the accountability and the support. So I feel like, you know, if we use the three of us as this little microcosm, the three of us did that for each other as we wrote the book for it to then cyclically spin out and help women, you know, who, who read it. I just, it is so important to build a community and to be able to have agreements and collaborations. And I feel like that is exactly what we did. We started the foundation by doing that in, and then encouraging women at all ages, but especially at an age where you really need to take inventory with where you make your agreements. Because, you know, how you decide to navigate yourself is going to have a direct outcome of how you feel physically and mentally and emotionally. And that's what I love is all the chapters of the book that, you know, my co-authors wrote is just it's so much resource and so much validation and inspiration sometimes to say no and that it's not best for me. But why is that? Not just because I have boundaries, just because I need physical support that's gonna make me become the things that I aspire to that others are not permitting me to have. And I just feel like I was very inspired, even on a personal level, by the girls' chapters because it made me feel like I have to keep going in these areas that I'm making agreements with. And I learned to kind of really look at my boundaries. Did you guys do that too during the writing of the book? Like to even understand like the boundaries and just the things that you said yes to that weren't benefiting. I personally found that very, very instrumental for me. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And um, I heard a quote recently, allow me to paraphrase, it's something to the extent of we are the sum total of the five people that we spend the most time with. Mm -hmm. So I want to be really picky about who that is because I want to rise. I want to grow. I want to make sure that the way that I show up is empowered and empowering to others. So to be around women like these who have strong, healthy boundaries, but are also so committed to what they do, that that inspires me. No, that makes Uh, sense. If you're hanging uh, out with four you know, really fit millionaires, you're probably going to be the fifth one. Right. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And if you're not going to be the millionaire, you're going to be the fit one, or at least, you know, if you're going to be, you know, if you're not going to be so fit, you're going to be rich. Yeah. I mean, those are great. Those are great templates. They'll influence you and you'll, you'll influence each other. Yeah. 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 Explain this, uh, Desi, explain this thing. What is it called? Uh, Kiai, Kiai, or I probably said that wrong, but it's a thing where you like, you yell like this tiger's roar to like get these emotions out. What is this? Yes. Um, it's called a kya, and it's yeah. just like what it sounds like. So in martial arts, you know, when they go kya, yeah. you're like Bruce Lee in the old movies, kya. Oh, okay. That's what it's called. And so um, my younger son is really, really deep into judo and before that taekwondo. And I would go to all these classes and I'm like, that is what we need to channel. And so that's a lot of what I taught to um, my, my pregnant clients. You know, when you're ready to push, you you dig deep and you find that tiger inside and you you use the power like people are going to tell you you know have your have your flameless candles in your room with therapy now that's fab but you got to have some power in you and that also translates into menopause and all of these different cycles of life we need to tap into our inner power so that we can um harness that and then choose where we direct it Okay. And so, and then be on the other side of that with the, with the, you know, getting the emotions out, the meditation, um, you, you, you mentioned that Have you, do you have a method of meditation that you guys prefer or like, like transcendental meditation or just any meditation? I mean, I think it's really specific for the individual. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a Buddhist. I, so I chant, you know, I do Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, but what I do might not work for somebody else. I don't know. I was very drawn to that. It works for me. But, you know, I think any type of meditation is fantastic, even if it's five minutes of breathing, you know, and just silence that, you know, that's three minutes. Yeah. Okay. We get the fight out of the body so that we can sit still. So if we can go for a run or lift weights or Kya or you know, find that power, then we have the ability to sit still and to quiet the mind. And for me, I like to use visualization and mantra, but I grew up with Namyo Horenge Kyo. So I love that, Nicole. And I think our, our country in general, we're kind of a little bit traumatized from the last couple of years. We've been in this fight or flight state on and off for two years. So For anyone who's drawn to meditation, like I highly encourage you, whatever feels right. If it's, you know, my YouTube channel or the Calm app or even something on Instagram or closing your eyes to Nicole's point and just finding two minutes of quiet, it's so nourishing. Oh, I agree. That's that's well said. I think I wish they could teach meditation in schools. I feel like it would really benefit kids. And and actually, I know schools are all about test scores. I feel like it would make test scores better, too. I agree. Yeah, You're absolutely. Right. Actually, you know, Goldie Hawn has a whole program for that. Really? She's dedicated yeah. her, her life to, I mean, for the last, I don't know how many years she's been doing it forever to get it in school. It's called mm-hmm. Mind Up. And it's all about teaching the children about meditation and, and quieting their thoughts and, um, and learning what those thoughts are. I don't know all of it, but I do know, you know, I know about it. So it's it's and it's getting into more and more schools. So you're right about the the quieting the brain, you know, for the children. So yeah, hopefully that will happen at some point. Well, that's amazing, <laughs> Nicole. I thought I knew everything about you, but like I didn't know this that the first time you did Pilates, you cried. Explain. I don't. I still don't understand. Like what happened? It was just really an emotion. It wasn't like because it was painful or something, right? It was. Yeah, no, it wasn't painful. I was doing the hundreds with Mari because, you know, that whole story. But Mm -hmm. um, when we were doing it and 
I just, it was so hard for me, obviously, but I just had this huge emotional release. And it was like all these emotions in my stomach. Cause I think honestly, you know, I had just moved to Los Angeles and whatever stress I was under. I don't think I really, I, I took breaths that deep. So I think when I did do the hundred, it was just such a release of everything, not only my breath, but everything that I'd been holding so tightly in my center. So yeah, I cried, but I was like, why am I crying? You know, I didn't, I didn't get it. That's you know? lovely, Nicole. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. That's so. really that's really cool. So we got yo and you have all the exercises in the book. That's why people need to buy the book, the yoga, the Pilates, and then the weight training. Talk about that. Why? Because I think a lot of women don't lift weights. They just do cardio. But but, but weights really are important. It's so yeah, important. Yes. It's so important. And so if we looked at it from the reasons why we want to do it from like the physiological and not the aesthetic, I mean it, the the it's numerous. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, let the mystery be when you turn the pages of the book to find out all the information. But just to kind of brief it, you know, uh, bone density would be the one flag that I would fly in that, you know, osteopenia and osteoporosis. And as our hormones start to change later in years, we start to get, you know, bone density loss. And that ends up in a break. And that ends up in a hip fracture and that ends up in you know surgery that is unnecessary and then also metabolic would be another reason why I would really promote it is simply because the more muscle mass you have think of it as akin to like a log in a fire if you have a huge log there's going to be a lot of heat and if we uh, you know agree that metabolism is heat and the move you know the um, expenditure of heat you're going to have a higher metabolism you're actually going to be leaner so I think that when women understand that they're not going to be massive bodybuilders, which is just such a fallacy, even after all these decades of research that we're still fighting women saying to us, I don't want to be huge. And it's like, sweetie, you are never going to be huge. You don't even possess the, 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 you know, the testosterone profile. You wouldn't be huge if it was, you know, that is just not what's going to happen. And so I just think that when women start to empower themselves with being like physically strong to be able to perform their daily lives, and then they're aesthetically strong to be able to actually have tone and be able to have shape in their lives, which makes it, you know, like who's getting who? It looks great in a pair of white jeans not only when you bend down and you know bend over and kiss your grandkids whatever it's just That's beneficial sad. and it's just it's a constant fight I think the three of us have gone through in the industry especially competing with like the really wafy wafy aesthetic even those girls really do lift they just don't lift as much you know it contributes and so it's a great question because I I always love a platform to promote it I, I'm sure you guys agree Absolutely. yeah yeah, no, that's, and that's, I love that you included all that. I, I think then that's another thing you talk about in the book is having a variety because otherwise, if you just do the same thing, it gets stale, right? Like you talk about, like, if you just walked every day, uh, you know, maybe that's a good place to start, uh, but eventually yeah. you need to start, you know, adding all, incorporating all the different types of, uh, you know, strength training, cardio, yoga, mm -hmm. stretching, all that stuff, right? Yeah. Yes. Adaptation yeah. is real. You know, adaptation is very real and your body is used to, you know, um, making sure that it overcomes the imposed demands. And if you demand that you walk 15 minutes a day very quickly, your body is going to be able to handle it. And then those gains or whatever aspirations you have are going to plateau and ceiling. And so you need the variety. But then also, too, with respect to, you know, diversion and, and different things, if you're really, really, you know, if you train only all the time to lift, you are missing components of a very well holistic based life. If you don't have the strength that Pilates would bring specific to that, or, you know, the range of motion that yoga, you are disserving yourself without combining the variety of those things, which is why we all jumped at doing the book. Cause really it's the first time you can find this uh, in the chapters to aggregate all those wonderful things with all the wonderful, you know, outcomes. Yeah. Do you think too, like if people are struggling to even, you know, cause this book is, this is what the celebrity uh, celebrities are doing. The, the, these are some of these workouts are kind of advanced, but if a person like just doesn't like exercising, wh where do you think they should start? Cause I heard a really good um, quote from somebody that they told me a story about how they, they were a counselor and they had this client who did not want to exercise. They said, I hate exercise. And he said, you've always hated exercise. Yeah. Always. Well, even when you're a kid, 
well, I liked a rollerblade when I was a kid. So, and she's like, okay, well, I guess I'll try that. So then she started rollerblading. She, that's her exercise. So do you think that's yeah. maybe a good place to start is finding something that you like? Like, I know for me, I like to swim. So I swim every day. That's great. hundred percent. Yeah. I, so the quote that I heard that I love that um, pertains to this is the best type of exercise is the exercise that you will do. So that's where we want to start for sure. Um, and yeah. then we can start to branch out into the different components. It's muscular strength, muscular endurance, flexibility, cardiovascular endurance, and uh, body composition, nutrition. So we'll get you all those eventually. But yeah, let's start with what you're actually going to show up and do. Yeah. I well, love so this quote too in the book. You say uh, the, you know, when you schedule, you should schedule the workouts like a to-do list and that time should be set, set up like a, a doctor's appointment. Like you should not, that, I'm like, oh, that's so perfect. That's a great analogy. Yeah. So that goes into um, part of exercise physiology and the study of exercise science. There's a, there's an aspect called adherence and exercise adherence simply refers to showing up. And as soon as you have an appointment with someone, your odds of showing up increase by, by about 50%. If you're showing up for someone else, like a fitness professional, like one of us, you're probably going to be there. You know, you're spending the money and you've made the commitment to us and to flake on us feels like a little yucky. Um, but to flake on yourself is a lot easier. So if we can simply put the appointment in there and honor that time for ourselves, that also um, helps us with those strong and healthy boundaries. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing that you have in the book that I love is you have all these insider tips scattered throughout the uh, book. I don't want to spoil all of it, but I do want to bring up this one that I liked. Um, it's a good tip that if you know, if you want to work out in the mornings and start your day worked out, then then you sleep in your workout clothes. I love I, I've heard that before. And, it, and I think that's a great idea because then you wake up and you're already it's like you're, you're already in like workout mode. You've already got your workout clothes on. Yeah. Maybe not the <laughs> shoes, <great>. but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an easy one. Or you can just put it next to the bed so that you're set up for success. The more you can um, choose yourself and make those choices easy, the easier it is to to show up. And um, so, Chuck, I've been watching your show a little bit more, and I've been like, you know, watching all these amazing um, musicians. Mm. And they show up year after year after year, and the persistence is there, and the passion is there. And so I think what we're all sort of in love with is, is having people fall in love with that for movement also. Yeah. Oh, and that, like I said, I think if you, if you don't like working out, start with something you like. And then I think once you kind of go down that path, then it's like, to me, it, like I always try to treat everything like a game, right? Like even with podcasting, I treat it like a game. I'm like, okay, like what clients, you know, what guests can I get? Like how many listens can I get? I treat it like a game and it make it fun. And right. maybe, and I, I feel like I do the same thing with, uh, with exercise and my diet. I'll be like, okay, like how, what can I get my body fat percentage at? What can I get my weight at? And it's like, and I treat it like a game and then I, and you want to win, right? Everybody wants to win. Nobody wants to lose the game. So I think that's a good way to, to treat it. Incentive is huge. And if you own your incentive, yeah and you think about a short-term incentive or a long-term incentive, all those things are really strong tools that will help you stay closer to really what you want to do because it requires you to organize it. The same as, you know, fiscal management and your bank account. If you are aware of what gets you to what you want to do and then you maintain it along the way, you have an investment. And so those are kind of strategies. And when you set up a strategy like that as even akin to a game, you have a way higher success at being, you know, closer to the motivation and closer to the outcome of what you've invested in. It really is a scientific formula, you know, and then self-love, just it's a scoop of self-love when you do it that way. Yeah. And if people want to, and I think you even have that in these workouts, when people get the book, they can see there's kind of like basic workouts and then it gets more advanced and you have these specific uh, uh, you know, workout names. Who came up with the names? Because some of them are so funny. Like, it was like no ifs, ands, or weak butts. Uh, curls for the girl. <laughs> Th this one was my favorite. Those waste removal, but it was like waste was spelled W A I S T. I, I thought that was really clever. Maybe it's cliched, but I'd never saw it. 
I just think if it's cheeky and you can have a sense of humor about it, because we don't always need to be so serious and clinical. We didn't, uh, you know, we don't need to show up in lab coats. At the end of the day, (laughs) when I get to a client's house, I may know what I'm talking about. But if I'm not on a unicycle juggling hoops of fire, trying to be entertaining day after day, year after year, you know, there has to have a little bit of fun. And I just think that we also wanted to offset the data and the information you know, which can sometimes, you know, be a little hard to digest just with a little bit of fun, because at the end of the day, yes, I do want to delay the onset of osteoporosis. But uh, I mean, shamefully, I still want a great ass for my husband. And I mean, that's okay. (laughs) I don't need to apologize for that. If we're able to like share with women the incentive of showing up for that reason, girl, show up, you know, show up and that and it's, you know, it, it can just be fun and shameless. Yeah. Speaking of fun, like, uh, Nicole, tell my audience about the, uh, the wine workout that you did with Kate Hudson. I think that was pretty fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we were both, I mean, we were traveling together and it was just, you know, we had no weights and we were trying to squeeze in a quick workout for before we were going somewhere we were in Greece, I guess, I think, yeah, Greece. And it was summertime and there were two bottles of rosé sitting there. So it was like, here you go. Here you go. (laughs) And we just were cracking up. But, you know, we did our arm workout with the rosé bottles. Amazing. Yeah, that was fun. get lighter over time and not heavier, but that's a a whole different different lifting (laughs) philosophy. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lifting philosophy, you know? Yeah, it's called drop sets. Yeah. Just, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Staying yeah. hydrated. Is there, because <laughs> um, there's, there's pictures in the book too. People should know, like I said, there's the workouts and it tells you, it shows you all the poses and everything. It's very well illustrated now. Is there, but is there a video supplement or could people, I mean, obviously they can follow you on social media and you guys post stuff there or YouTube channel. I think yeah. We, we have stuff have in the works. Workouts though. Um, pre this book, like, Desi mentioned earlier, and I have these old workout videos also when DVDs were a thing. Um, But now they're all on Vimeo, um, Vimeo on demand. So I'm there and there's like quick, you know, workouts. A lot of the exercises are the ones that are in the book because Pilates is a set series of exercises. And then some I made a little bit different just because out of, you know, boredom. Um, And I like being creative. And then I know Andrea has DVDs too. Um, So, but not, not this exact set yet, but that's to come. Yeah. Okay. So what do you, this is not in the book. I I was just going to pick your brain on this topic because it seems related obviously to fitness and weight loss and health and diet and all that stuff. It seems like there's just like two extremes in our world right now. Like there's You've got the fat shaming, like they'll, they'll put those, you know, the media or whatever will post a picture of someone in a bikini and say, oh, look out, they've gained weight or whatever. But then you've also got like this body positivity thing where obesity is OK and it's it, people should just be obese and that's they're beautiful the way they are. And then they shouldn't exercise and work out. How do you what, what are your thoughts on those two extremes? Because I, I don't really like either one of them, but I, I, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. No, you're absolutely right. It's like, because I think like there was a period of time where women had to be skinny, skinny, skinny. And I think now being a little more full is more acceptable. But it's like, like, you know, I think everybody should just focus on themselves and be happy with where they're at in their own weight. And, you know, I mean, everyone's different as long as, you know, uh, if somebody is heavier as long as they're, you know, they don't have diabetes or a heart failure. You know what I mean? Like if it's not going to screw up their health, then, and they feel comfortable, then that's their, that's their choice, you know, but I don't ever think anyone should get shamed on either end of the spectrum. I just don't think that's, that's cool, you know, because, you know, especially as women, we fluctuate so much our entire lives um, with our weight. I mean, I know I have from high school till even now, you know, um, it's just, you know, we expand and we contract and our body is amazing. And I think that it should be celebrated. 
I Absolutely. Agree. Well said. Yeah. I'm sorry about the men too, though. Maybe, you know. Yeah. Well, and they're so <laughs> acceptable for men to, you know, be however, um, you know, like if, I don't know. Go ahead, Andrea. You were going to say something. No, just of lately, you know, we were asked to um, comment on something that was going on in uh, the headlines recently regarding a celebrity who had a kind of... Um, uh, embracing her weight. And so they wanted us to talk about body positivity and body neutrality. And the difference between that one being that body positivity is just saying, uh, if I am, you know, uh, overweight, that is beautiful. Whereas body neutrality says I'm ambivalent to my shape and my form, but I celebrate that my body achieves so much. It respirates, it's given birth to a baby where it's not as aesthetic in the superficial realm, polar to the positivity where we're supposed to just say, the way it is, is beautiful. And, you know, those are very good. Those are very good proponents to look at oneself. However, I think the measurements doesn't, isn't, you know, uh, so aesthetic in that it's functional. What, what is your, what is your heart rate level? What is your blood pressure level? Are you mm -hmm. on the, is your, you know, I know sometimes people don't like the basal metabolic rate that, you know, and the BMI measurements. So if one were to be categorized as, you know, morbidly obese, what does that mean in regards to your quality of life and your mortality? And I think that we need to start really like widening the aperture as to what we think is health versus what we think is appearance. Because they're not the same things. And we know that. And I think that that needs to be discussed more and more and more and more without glossy ads and all those things telling us how skinny someone has come back from having a baby or how thin someone is or how, you know, uh, Rebel Wilson, as an example, has lost so much weight. I mean, really, what what are her what are her vitals? But no one talks about that because it's not, you know, uh, clickbait. And I just think that it's frustrating. And so we have started to try and encourage women to look at themselves holistically we do ask you know aesthetically want to be a certain you know pleasing but if you let's say are a size two and you're six feet tall but you have diabetes you have other things to really consider that are going to end your life prematurely if you don't learn about them and I just I feel like we succeeded in encouraging people to look at themselves that way yeah it just seems like there's a lot of judgment all over. I mean, people got mad at Adele for losing weight or, or uh, right. like you said, Rebel Wilson and um, uh, Lena Dunham, I think, had lost some weight. And people like it's like she sold out because she lost weight. It's just it's yeah. a strange concept to me. Like, I think that's great if people want to get healthy. But on the other end of the spectrum, I don't think people should shame them. If people are overweight, they might be struggling with something we don't know. They might have hormone issues. They might have something going on in their life. Like, it's just weird to see the shaming. I don't get that. Yeah. And it's a double edged sword, especially those of us working in the industry. You know, mm -hmm. like there was something said of me one time, like she probably holds the secrets to Victoria's Secret. And, you know, there's some things that I uh, at this point in time would look back on and say, you know, people made an agreement for a job that was required. And I wouldn't encourage people to do it as a lifestyle, as you mentioned earlier, Chuck, with, you know, like you can't last long doing certain things. And so when people then make decisions to become healthy and their consequence is a certain appearance, it's like we're telling them that they haven't had this body positivity that we want them to have. But we really have no idea what people's aspirations are and what that looks like internally. You know, that's between someone and their doctor and between them and the mirror. Where we're inserting ourselves in that is absolutely bonkers. Mm -hmm. Well said. No, I love that. Yeah, it's just, I, I like that. You're right. It's like treat it like a medical thing. Because, I mean, I go to my doctor once a year and he makes recommendations and I just try to follow that and do what he says. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we should all do. But definitely this people should get this book because I think that there's a lot of great information in there, a lot of good workouts that people can use. And um, I think it could change a lot of people's lives. I think it's a great book to put out there in the world. I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, yeah. that was the goal, right? If we can help one person, I think we've done our job. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and like I said, the, the, I mean, such credibility with these uh, actresses that, you know, and uh, A-list celebrities that you guys have worked with. Um, is there anything else that you want to promote besides this book? Any other projects? Silence. Really? 
Not on the front. Right. What could we disclose? What could we disclose? All oh, the <laughs> secret I, stuff. I, I, well, I like the secret stuff. My short film is going to be in a film festival in, um, in, in New York again. In 40-ish or another one? Yes. Yeah. Still, it, it's like the little film that could, it keeps on trucking. Because, you know, because of COVID, a lot of the festivals, like, put it on pause. So now people are coming more out. So it's two years later. Um, and uh, it's just now getting going. I think it's funny, but it's so exciting. It's been fun. But it's in a festival um, in September called New New Faces. Um, and now I'm forgetting the full name and they're going to kill me. How, um, do I, how do I watch the movie, by the way? Because I tried to find it today and I couldn't find it. Uh, you, you know, it, it, it's not it, online yet. Yeah, okay. We're like uh, after the the festival um, circuit, sure. and okay. hopefully we can get it, you know, sold or up up somewhere streaming. Um, so you know, I don't know when that's going to be though, unfortunately. So um, I apologize. Okay. Well, people can pre-order, they can pre-order the book right now, right? And then they can all, of course, they yes. can follow you on social media. And there is a Instagram profile for the book that I follow as well. So if they want updates on the book or they can follow that, right? Yes, Total Body Beautiful. And the, and the website, www.totalbodybeautiful.com. Yes. Okay. With links to all the places that are selling the book, which is Amazon, Target, and Barnes & Noble. So when is uh, it coming out? I forgot. Cause I, I was like, well, it's out for me now. So I didn't, I forgot that, but I probably need to let the audience know when <laughs> they can read it. What was the date on that? Desi? Um, I think the, the release date is October 3rd and that's when okay. they'll start sending it out from Amazon. And I think the reason that you heard crickets for a moment when you said what else is coming up is because we're so focused on this book and we're so excited. We have a book release party in Los Angeles the first week of October. We're getting together um, in about two weeks time so we can take photos with the book. And it's just like a culmination of over a year and a half of work that we get to celebrate. That is very yes. cool. Is the party open to the public or is it like a private event? Well, unfortunately, the first this this event, um, we're only allowed. It's actually I'm excited. It's going to be at Book Soup, which for me is like super cool because, you know, I Book Soup has been there for years and it's just so iconic to me. It's one of like, you know, Los Angeles's oldest bookstores and um they are going to have our, I guess, release party. And, but we're only allowed 40 people. Mm. So unfortunately, but we will have more that hopefully we can get one at Barnes and Noble and, mm -hmm. and be able to invite lots of more people. And hopefully we'll be sort of showing up at bookstores in different places. I hope. Um, yeah. Would you do a tour where you like a book signing tour? Get is that hard to get all three of you with your schedules? I know that we're showing up to the one at the winery where we're using the models as props, but I think that's as far as we've gotten <laughs> for that one that we're all showing up. Um, but yeah, well, we'll have to refer to the calendar after that, right? Okay. Yeah, we're talking about going to major cities, but I think what you'll see a lot of, and one of the silver linings for um, or from the last few years has been that we are able to communicate effectively digitally. So you will see digital release parties. You will see us giving away um, like Instagram live, who wants to win a copy of the book, that kind of thing. We wanna make sure that we reach women all over the world, um, not just the United States. When we did an Instagram live together, we had people from China and England, in Mexico as the, you know, like countries everywhere. So if we can share with the world, like that's our honor. That's I mean, I love it. Well, global, then. global vision. Um, I always end each episode uh, promoting a charity. I think last time when Nicole was on, we promoted the ALS Foundation. Do you want to promote that? Or is there any other charities you want to give a shout out to? Um, so there's one. Yes, there's one in Los Angeles. It's called the PS I Love You Foundation. And um, to your point earlier, Chuck, about offering meditation in schools, mm. they offer yoga and meditation to at-risk youth in um, South Central Los Angeles. I've taught for them before. They also sponsor a day at the beach. So they take children who um, perhaps have never had the opportunity to see the ocean that they live 10 miles away from to go mm. and play at the beach with other um, responsible adults acting as counselors, leading games. 
the woman who runs that, Patricia Jones, she's near and dear to my heart. She's been doing that for over 25 years. So I, I highly encourage you all to check that out. Okay, great. So after people order the book, if they have a few extra bucks lying around, they can throw it that way then. I'll put yes. the website in the show notes and also the website to order the book. I think that, that's on the, your website, right? Uh, the, the links to order the book, pre-order? All of it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. All right. All the, the links are set up there. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for doing this, ladies. I'll get this episode out soon. No, thank you. you. Nice you talking too. to you. Great thank questions. You. Bye, ladies. It's your track. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Okay, thank you again to Nicole Stewart, Andrea Orbeck, and Desi Bartlett. Uh, the book is called Total Body Beautiful. It's available for pre-order now, or it may be readily available, depending on when you're listening to this episode. Uh, check out the website in the show notes. It's there along with the charity website that we mentioned and my website. Uh, thank you all for listening. Have a great day, and remember, shoot for the moon. <laughs> <laughs>